second. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Oliver Lies, and I warmly welcome you to today's eSports Research Colloquium. I am really happy to welcome Dr. Mark John uh, Johnson. Sorry. I'm really happy that Dr. Mark R. Johnson join us today and will talk about his research on ethical judgment of eSports spectators on cheating in eSports. As always, please feel free to actively participate participate in the discussion after the presentation and ask your questions. In doing so, please also notice that this meeting is being recorded. If you are interested in reading the preprint of the study Mark presents today, you can send him or myself a message using his Twitter or email account or my Twitter or email account. Without further ado, Mark, feel free to present your research now and I'm looking forward to discussing your ideas and your research. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the intro. Hi, all. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not on camera. I'm one of these people who gets pretty intense Zoom fatigue from being on camera. About 10 minutes on camera takes me about an hour to recover from for some reason. So I will be voice only, but I promise I am physically present. I, I am a real physical human, not some kind of incredibly uh, good AI. So hi, all. Uh, my, name, my name is Mark. I'm a lec at the University of Sydney and along with my co-author Brett uh, we have done this study on what esports viewers think about cheating in esports and in this talk I'll kind of talk through some of our uh, findings especially some of our uh, um, stranger or more intriguing findings in terms of how esports viewers make judgments about different kinds of cheating some kinds of cheating being more or less um, acceptable than other kinds and so on, and why we think this might be and what this, what this might, might mean for esports going forward. So first off, clearly, um, in terms of why esports cheating is worth exploring, esports is clearly by far the highest stakes, if you will, space or context in which, dig in which digital game cheating takes place. Although we've all, I'm sure, played competitive online games and maybe we've encountered cheaters or maybe we've even, we've even been the cheaters ourselves, gosh. But even, but even, but even if we have encountered cheaters in... Um, competitive games online, in, in general, these stakes there are pretty low. We might get a little bit annoyed, we might rage a little bit, we might quit, we might report someone, these sorts of things, but in general, esports is clearly the highest stakes context in which cheating takes place. Um, and this can not just affect the integrity of play in terms of the games themselves, of course, but also has potential impacts on incomes, careers, game lifespans, these sorts of things, and it, and it does not seem unreasonable to say that at least a certain level of game uh, integrity will be important for the future of esports and for its regulation and for its growth and so on. And also there's questions here around player health and so on in light of the potential motivations or pressures towards, for instance, cheating or substance use or things of this sort in order to try to gain some kind of edge in esports contests. But first off, I think it's worth saying, what is cheating? This might sound extremely obvious. It's one of those things where you think, well, I know what cheating is when I see it, but uh, cheating is surprisingly hard to pin down. Um, some of the earliest games research um, argued that cheating or cheaters are players who recognize goals, but not rules, right? So if you were cheating in golf, the goal is to get the ball into the hole on the green. The rules are it must be done with these sticks and you must have a certain a number of hits and so on so if you cheat you simply pick up the ball walk walk to the hole and put the ball in so you've accomplished the goal but not done it via uh keeping in with the rules while others argue that cheating can be seen uh, as a kind of recreation of a game where when you wind up with cheating a new game emerges with a different set of rules but the crucial uh reference here I think is Consalvo's work from uh, 2008 on cheating where she argued for a spectrum of players and a spectrum of perspectives on this where at one end you have so-called purist players who think that anything other than completing a game entirely by yourself without any external aids, tools, tips etc is cheating 
And at the other end, players who would argue that only another person can be cheated, a uh, single player game cannot be cheated. And then in the middle would be people who would who would focus on uh, the game's code and its intended rules and so on, while still saying that things like guides or having a friend help you and so on are not cheating. But I mention this because I think, um, although, like I say, we think of cheating as this extremely clear, extremely absolute act, um, what I'll show in this research is that esports viewers do not view cheating as an absolute. They, they instead view it as something far more complex, complex and something far more negotiated. So what does esports cheating entail? Of course, there's a bunch of methods. I'm sure lots of you have heard of these. Um, aim bots and things of this sort where you have software which can aim or in some way put inputs into the game which are more precise or faster or better than that a human can do of course there's 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 also if you aren't playing on lan the opportunity for online for online attacks and ddos attacks and things of this sort also there's doping of course various uh, esports slash compare Sort of games have had various kinds of controversies around various kinds of doping, especially drugs which uh, boost attention or boost reflexes and things of this sort. Also, of course, though, I think we should, to some extent, view things like trash talking as 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 being a as being a kind of cheating, where the goal is to, in some sense, disable or throw off the other player. Um, and also there's match fixing as well in, in uh, esports, which is in essence the same as in physical sports, i.e. you place a bet against yourself and then you make sure you lose, this type of thing. So in looking to explore esports cheating and how players think about esports cheating, um, all the data here is drawn from the qualitative component of a survey which was sent out a few years back uh, in which participants gave their views on those kinds of esports cheating and what sorts of punishments or repercussions should, uh, should accompany different kinds of esports cheating. The really crucial part here is that the end of this survey, which went out to about seven and a half thousand people, I think, filled it in. The final part was an open qualitative form for, for respondents to just write whatever they, would, they wanted to about the topic of esports cheating. And in that final uh, open qualitative part of the, sur of the survey, there were 1,370 responses. Seeing as this is um, gamers, some of the comments were swear words, insults, memes, in-jokes, slurs, these sorts of things. But once we clean those out, we were left with 1,321 comments from esports viewers on what they thought about cheating. And it's these comments, and this is quite a big uh, sample size, of course, for this kind of qualitative content analysis type work. And it's these quotes we draw on here. So uh, first off, um, there were very different responses given for what viewers thought about cheating to win, i.e. doing something to make yourself more likely to win, such as doping or hacking or macros on your keyboard, this type of stuff, and cheating to lose, i.e. match fixing. And uh, respondents, as these quotes show, were pretty united in their condemnation of cheating to win. Respondents all argued that it should never be tolerated, it should have a lifetime ban or at least a ban for several years, um, and that it's, quote, the absolute worst kind of cheating and should be a lifetime ban every time, no matter the level of prize pool. And that final comment might seem strange, but um, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, the connections between what esports viewers watch in terms of big top level, big money esports contests, and also their own experiences of playing competitive games, those sorts of links are very important. And with these sorts of quotes, we saw lots of respondents saying that cheating to win does does not only matter if you're playing for a huge for a huge amount of money in some arena in Katowice. It matters even if you are playing every day competitive games. And I think also the intensity of the intended punishments here of lifetime bans or two year bans. I mean, a two year ban is basically a lifetime ban, right? If you aren't uh, competing at the top level in esports for two years, 
it's pretty unlikely that your career will pick back up after the end of that. So in trying to think through why this might be, um, I think it's important to note that, of course, many online games are full of, are full of cheaters. Um, I'm sure we've all experienced this. Um, I don't play competitive multiplayer games these days, but when I, when I was a teenager, I did, and I can't think of any game I ever played which was completely devoid of cheating. And there's a little bit of research on this which shows that um, these experiences of being cheated in competitive online games just just for everyday players leaves quite a strong effect on them in terms of um, resentment, in terms of anger, yet also it seems to boost how committed to and keen on that game people are, which is perhaps out of a kind of determination to beat a cheater, to win back what they've lost, to prove that they can win even against someone who's not playing by the rules, these sorts of things. And the crucial point here, of course, is that most esports uh, viewers are also players of the games which they watch, of course. And most esports viewers are likely to have had experience playing competitive multiplayer player games and therefore in turn encountering and being frustrated by cheaters themselves. Um, and so this is, we think, one, one, one of the main ways where we can explain why Esports viewers are so hostile towards cheating to win. They have, in most cases, themselves experienced it. Maybe not for money, for high stakes, for high prestige as part of their job, but just simply being someone who plays competitive online games, chances are you will run into a cheater. Chances are you will, you, you will have run into, into people using macros or, or aimbots or whatever. And this sense of deep resentment appears to be transferred from their own experiences in to a kind of broader, more absolute sense of what acceptable practice in esports is and is and isn't, and the kind of immediate emotional responses to esports cheating being so frustrating when you're playing CSGO or something and someone cheats against you seems to be transferred in to why they have such a stark idea of how brutally punished e uh, cheating to win esports cheaters should be. However, when we think about cheating to lose, so things like match fixing and so on, a very different picture is here. And what we found from these responses is the viewers are relatively unconcerned by cheating to lose, which is uh, quite strange. And in these next few slides, I, I'll try to kind of talk through why this, why this might be. Um, and some of these quotes, as in the middle of the slide, um, lots of the respondents on this survey would say things like, um, if you cheat to lose, then you should be dropped from that event, but that's it or you should be banned for one week, or, 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 or you should forfeit a small, uh, a, a, a small volume of prize money, or um, these sorts of things, while others, of course, um, used terms like losing intentionally to describe what we would talk about as cheating to lose. And, and as I'll talk about on, on, on the next few slides, I think this tells us something about what exactly esports viewers perceive cheating to lose to be. But the key point here is that cheating to lose is seen as far less problematic, far less important, far less of a violation of esports, of gaming, of whatever, than cheating to win. And hence it merits far milder punishments. But one strange thing emerged here, which is that uh, what we want to argue, and we do in the full full uh, paper is that um, it doesn't appear that most esports viewers have a complete sense of what cheating to lose entails. And cheating to lose is, of course, by its nature, far more complex than cheating to win, right? If you just install a hack, install a macro, take some drugs, these sorts of things, these boost your chances to win. Whereas cheating to lose, of course, speaks to a far more complex ecosystem of players, contests, money, sports betters, these sorts of things. And the strong sense we got was that um, esports viewers are, are not really completely aware of what this ecosystem is. And one thing which made this point is that uh, many viewers in this survey equated cheating to lose with what we would call bracket manipulation, i.e. 
losing against a certain opponent so that later in the context uh, contest you get a a player or a team who you would rather play than them of course and this is something which takes place in physical sports and takes place in uh, esports but as you can see from these top quotes this was a survey about cheating in esports but all these sorts of respondents were talking instead about bracket manipulation not cheating to lose via things like match fixing and these sorts of quotes framed bracket manipulation and this kind of deliberate losing as a strategic move rather than a form of cheating and so what we argue is that lots of respondents don't seem to have a clear picture of what cheating to lose entails and how this kind of broader ecosystem um, functions and this all seems to imply that the responsibility and therefore blame for cheating to lose in some sense shouldn't go on to the people who do it but to the tournament rather than to the players i.e to a tournament for being in the eyes of these viewers sufficiently poorly structured that it encourages cheating to lose um, and respondents who compared cheating to win and cheating to lose were united in agreement that cheating to win is by far the worst crime so in trying to make sense of some of this um, what we see here and this and this is kind of the core argument of the full paper is that esports viewers care more about rules than ethics in one sentence that's the big finding i guess from this piece of research when it comes to to cheating esports viewers seem to be far more concerned about the breaking of rules than they do about the breaking of ethics um, and what we mean by this is that um, many of the respondents, for instance, talked about the I by power uh, scandal, which was now seven years back, good grief, um, where they were banned for uh, match fixing. And this was a very visible, very public case, a very controversial one, and was extremely central in what respondents on this survey had to say. For instance, one uh, wrote that the team should be unbanned because there was not a clear rule set by Valve prior to the crime. So what they're saying is, if you do something bad, but there's no law against it, then that's fine, because there was no law to prevent you from doing that. And then this next quote, the actions were bad, but should be taken in context. Quote, they did not have a wage and prize pools were small and they were trying to get by. And so here, this respondent drew recourse to the kind of broader labor and work ecosystem of esports to argue esports is really hard and therefore we should understand that they match fixed in essence. And then this third quote here, it does not excuse it, but, but it is different now, i.e. if there's more wage, more income, more job security and all these sorts of, and all these sorts of things, then that changes this kind of moral calculus which esports viewers seem to be doing here. Then this final quote again um, argued that uh, the I by power players were quote under the influence which of course in general means that you're drunk or high on some kind of illegal drug because they were paid nothing and needed money to survive and keep playing. So this commenter again stressed that leniency would be appropriate because the players had so little money and had to find some way to make money and that just happened to be by by match fixing and these are quite striking comments i think um but what the show is also that even if esports viewers tend not to be super aware of how match fixing takes place it seems they do seem to be quite aware of what the wider kind of professional esports ecosystem looks like in the sense that cheating to lose at least can be framed as an almost acceptable practice in the context of esports being a really hard, really demanding, really precarious, really difficult career path. And fans seem to forgive quite a lot of uh, cheating or cheating type behaviors if, if they perceive some kind of ethical justification beyond the game itself. Um, and so these sorts of judgments about rule breaking rendered that same rule breaking more okay than it might otherwise be. But why? 
Well, we talked about the experiences of esports viewers when it comes to experiencing cheating themselves, but there's two other aspects here which we think are important to draw out. So the first is to think about esports viewers and esports players and people who play competitive games in general through the lens of, of, of a term like power gamers, right? These are people who tend to focus on strategic aspects and mechanical aspects of games rather than story, artwork, music, these sorts of things, with a focus on trying to kind of manipulate or exploit the rules of games to the greatest potential uh, extent. And this is found in cultures like speedrunning, right, where the goal is to push the rules, the rules of that game as far as it can go and speed through all the story, all the intended plot, all these sorts of things, and focus purely on the mechanical aspects of that game and how far they can be pushed. So focus on the rules of that game rather than the other aspects of that game. And in general, as recent works have shown, Gamers do enjoy pushing rules to their limits and trying and trying to find ways around rules and consequently there's a sense of game rules being things which can be navigated or perhaps even exploited in some contexts, rather than always being respected, while at the same time this very same view views games as rule sets, first and foremost, and so we have this kind of weird balance in gaming where we have lots of people who view games first and foremost as, as sets of rules, and yet also see that, that those rules should, should be broken, should be twisted, should be challenged, and all these sorts of things. And we argue in the, in the full paper that these sorts of ideas seem to have impacted how viewers think about esports cheating, both for grounding rules over ethics, as in those sorts of comments with people saying, well, there was no rule against cheating, so it's fine that they cheated, while also being quite kind and quite generous to uh, players if those rules are transgressed or bent or broken in certain sorts of contexts. In turn, we also think that this focus of rules over ethics is also to do with a concern with esports legitimacy. Um, and there were lots of quotes in this survey which suggested that uh, viewers are very keen for esports to not be reduced or undermined or negatively impacted by cheating, as some of these quotes show. Um, and there was this idea that for esports to be taken in air quotes seriously as a kind of competitive context, contest as a sport and so on, that there cannot be any kind of cheating. And, chi and, and that no kind of successful, viable, long-term sport-based ecosystem can exist if cheating is rife. Um, and so for esports to, quote, have the image of a real competitive sport, unquote, then the punishments which people are given must be harsh and must be quite strict as a result. And so what we see here is this idea that Esports can be kind of further legitimated through very strict and very appropriate and very well used rules, while at the same time, as we've just said, the, the respondents also said that manipulating these rules is okay and is fine and is part of being a skilled gamer. And so these strange sort of um, ambiguous um, um, relationships between rules and ethics and um, expected conducts of players and what viewers think players should be doing, what players think tournament organizers should be doing, what sorts of things players see as being legitimate or non-legitimate esports practices. These things are all very confused here. Um, and while this is quite a fast run through, um, I hope that, that I've kind of been able to give here a sense of how a, like I say, um, viewers tend to focus on issues of rules rather than ethics in terms of what is cheating or what should be thought of as being cheating. The focus is on whether or not rules, rules were broken rather than whether or not some kind of unethical practice took place. And in turn, the second kind of key finding is that esports viewers care far more and know far more and themselves experience far more when it comes to cheating to win, hacking, doping, macros, and so on, than when it comes to cheating to lose, 
such as match fixing and so on. And I think that these are kind of quite important issues for what esports will look like going forwards when so much of this uh, ecosystem and the people who both play and watch in this kind of study, I think we see a lot of these kind of unspoken values, unspoken assumptions uh, when, it, when it comes to what esports is and what it should be and so on. And these, I think, will be very important as esports moves forward and in an era when there are more and more bodies trying to handle esports cheating, trying to create global esports regulations, all this sort of stuff. I think this is a really good time both as scholars to be exploring these kinds of dynamics of why do why do sports viewers have these particular views on cheating and also in more pragmatic uh, contexts outside of the university when thinking about what esports is and where it might be going. So thank you all so much for listening. Um, if you'd like the preprint, please do send me an email. Uh, I hope it will be coming out in convergence soon, but uh, paper reviewing is always a thrilling process, so we'll see how that goes. Thanks so much, everyone, and uh, any questions? Thank you so much for your presentation, Mark. I, I really appreciated the insights you provided into spectators' judgments um, on cheating in esports. And I have to digest the results uh, a little bit more, but what was surprising to me was um, mm. cheating to lose. Um, mm, mm. was really interesting but the first question that comes in, into my mind is um, what do you think will be your future research or the research of your department on this area oh um, well my main field of research is twitch and kind of esports is my kind of secondary thing um, so right now there's no future research specifically on esports cheating planned um i have some forthcoming pieces um which will be more around the idea of authenticity in esports and what that means to various actors with in esports but um in but in terms of cheating um i think future research in this area which which i might do of course um I think future research in this area, I think it would be good to focus on what the other side of the esports world thinks, as in what do people who run events think, what do sponsors think, what do companies think, what do big arenas think, what do people in these various anti-cheating or regulation or sport or sport integrity bodies, what do these people think about cheating? Because I think we would get a very different image from them, without a doubt. Um, I think from them, we would see a perspective which probably ranks cheating to win and cheating to lose as being equally bad, I suspect. Um, I think we would also likely see that, um, I think a lot of these people also would be vastly more concerned by cheating to lose than most of these, most of these esports viewers as, in an era when esports and game and gaming in general are both becoming increasingly gamblified in many ways and are kind of increasingly inching towards various sorts of gambling um, ecosystems. I think from the professional slash corporate side, I think we'd see a lot more concern about those aspects there. I also see a question from Eric in chat. Thank you. Um... Yeah, we can start with the question by Eric. Thank you for that question and answering, um, Mark. Eric yes, uh, uh, said, great presentation. What do you think, how much of the cheating culture in esports comes from the anonymity mm. on the internet? And I would suggest perceiving lower supervision of players. Firstly, Eric, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, to answer your question, um, Yes, I think I think the proliferation of, che of cheating in online competitive games absolutely. I mean, there's 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 so much research out there on how basically pretty much every online toxic behavior can be connected to being anonymous, right? To some extent, um, and I and I don't think cheating is 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 any different on that front. Um, I don't know of any of any work specifically exploring the anonymity dimension of competitive gaming slash esports slash online gaming um, cheating, as there's very few papers on this topic at all. But um, I definitely think a lot of a lot of this comes from the lack of 
consequence, the lack of accountability and all these sorts of things. And so from that context, one might then ask, well, then why are these mega big name superstar esports pros with, uh, with 10 million people on Twitter who follow them and so on, why would they take that risk when there's so much to lose? And the answer, of course, is twofold, I think. One, yes, there's so much more to lose if you're a megastar and you're caught cheating than you're a person who's just called Joe Blogs 82 on Steam or something. There's, there's so much more to lose, yes, but there's also so much more to gain. Joe Blogs 82 on Steam, who cheats on CSGO, can't make money from it, can't profit from it, can't get fame from it, can't get deals with sponsors from it, can't pay his bills with it. Whereas the top esports player can, in fact, get money and sponsors and pay their bills and all this stuff. And so even though the risk and the punishment uh, and the repercussions if caught are so much higher, the benefits if not caught are also so much higher. And in turn, I think, um, like if we look at some of those um, early Korean esports cheating scandals, like there's such a strong sense there that the precariousness of being an esports player is central here that these people feel a lot of pressure to, in some sense, do whatever they can to make sure this job goes on and they keep it and they continue to do well and they keep their sponsors and so on. And so I think for those at the, for those at the top, um, although the supervision of players, as you put it, is extremely high, I also think the inclination and the potential rewards are also extremely high. And so it's like, everyday cheating on CSGO, the rewards are super low, but also the punishment is super low. In top level esports, the rewards are super high, but also the punishment is super high as well. And so I think, and so the ratio stays the same, I guess is the point I'm making. Um, and I think that's how we can kind of explain why, the, why although yes, cheating in, in everyday competitive games does, I think in large part, come from anonymity and the extremely mild punishments, if any, which happen if someone is caught cheating. I think we can also find particular sources for why people are still strongly encouraged, as it were, to cheat at top level esports as well. I agree. I, I think this was a great question and a great explanation by you, Mark. Um, mm. I'd like to add that um, this depends on a variety of concepts or aspects in my perception and also refers to goal commitment and values. And mm. the mm. fact that goal commitment is more important, I think, in terms of making decisions than values, because you can have values but never really act on them, then Goal commit commitment can uh, force players to, to make decisions like cheating to get rapid results. And the lack of consequences, as you mentioned, Mark, mm -hmm. is really a factor that needs to be changed, I think. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And um, in and like I think all this should be framed. And uh, I hope that you guys will forgive the shameless uh, plug here, but I wrote a paper on this a while back, which I just put in chat. Um, I think all this should be framed in the wider context of what sorts of careers are young people looking at these days, right? We live, we live in a world where gig work and zero hour contracts are ever more common. We live in a world where fewer and fewer people are able to find fulfilling work. We live in a world where more and more wealth is hoarded by the global elite. And so in this context, I hardly think that it's surprising both how driven young people are to pursue these kinds of esports jobs. Because I mean, would you rather work in an office for six days a week for 40 years to help Jeff Bezos buy a brand new yacht? Or would you rather make a living playing video games on the internet? Of course you'd rather do the latter, right? Of course. Um, and so I think like all this, we, we have got to frame in terms of contemporary labor conditions and what do aspirational esports players perceive those conditions to be? If I was 18 and I looked out at what my job prospects were, I would not feel optimistic. And I think I'd be right to not feel optimistic. Um, and again, that doesn't 
defend or justify or excuse, but it definitely does explain, I think, to some extent that if you are someone who's managed to dance between the raindrops and have the skill and the hard work to get to the top and you have found sponsors and you found a team and you and you make a full-time living and you know that there's 10,000 people out there who are almost as good as you are and if you fall from grace they will take up your spot instantly I think we can begin to see some of the psychological conditions that would precipitate thinking about cheating. I think we can. Um, and as some of the respondents I mentioned in my talk said, um, they took this argument that it is more acceptable or more forgivable to do these sorts of cheating actions when the players themselves aren't making money or are not securely employed or don't know where their job is going and these sorts of things. And while I would not go that far, I do think, I think it is understandable, even if not necessarily more acceptable. I do think it is understandable what sorts of pressures um, these young people are under. And, 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 so just one more thing on this. And like, we must keep in mind that most of, most of these players, if they're 18 or 20 or 22 and they're playing at the top level, this is the only job that they've ever had in most cases. The only job that they've ever had. Many don't go to higher ed as well. This is the only kind of sense of the world that they have up until this point. And so, again, it doesn't excuse, but I think it does help explain why some very foolish choices when it comes to cheating might be made by people whose entire adult lives up to this point have been playing video games for massive amounts of money. I think we can begin to see some of the uh, causes behind cheating, I think, here, yeah. I'm sorry for the drilling machine, uh, if you hear this. <laughs> Not to um, worry. My question would be, um, to, my, to my knowledge, um, there, was, there are some studies that uh, investigated stressors in esports and coping strategies, mm -hmm. and they didn't mention that cheating, cheating to win, cheating to lose. Mm -hmm. This was not... Uh, uh, mentioned by or acknowledged by professional players in Counter-Strike or by um, professional players in League of Legends. Do you have any information on how frequently cheating is being performed? Are there any well, studies to your knowledge? Um, I think we, we talk about this in the full paper. There's basically four papers before this one about esports cheating and none of them address that question, sadly. Um, Essentially, um, I don't think it's surprising that players don't talk about it a lot. Um, I think it's one of those things where just kind of everyone wants to not mention it because going back to the kind of to the kind of legitimation arguments in these slides, I think the 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 sense which I get is that I think esports players collectively probably probably feel it's in no one's interest to highlight cheating. Basically, it's in no one's interest to talk about this with, with journalists, with academics, with whoever. It's just not in the interest of their industry that, that they depend on to talk about cheating all that much. So I think there's, there's that factor. Um, in terms of how, com how common it is, it seems to be pretty rare. It seems to be pretty rare. Um, like every now and then there's a scandal, but a decent number turn out to be nothing. Um, and these days, I think a lot of the top competitions do have a lot of stuff in place to maximize integrity in terms of what keyboards and mice people bring in. Sometimes they do drug tests and these sorts of things um, in, term, in terms of trying to limit trash talking, in terms of trying to make sure context, contests are done on land rather than online and so on. Um, I think, I think that there's a lot in place to prevent it. In some ways, to be honest, more than physical sports in some ways. But I think over time, cheating to lose will become the bigger issue for the exact same reasons that cheating to lose is far more common in physical sports than cheating to win, which is it's harder to catch. It's more complex and it's harder to spot, basically. Right? If you just meet with a friend in a dark alley at night and you give them some money to place a bet that you'll lose and they go off and they place that bet 
and you lose. And then a week later in some other place, you meet and share the proceeds. It's incredibly hard to catch that, incredibly hard. And that's why match fixing has always existed in sport and still does now. And although, of course, kind of, kind of anti-match fixing measures are much stronger than they were once, um, I mean, match fixing takes place in every sport still, I'm sure. Um, so I think although cheating to lose is far less understood and far less disliked by esports viewers, like I argued, in large part because they've never experienced it, right? Whereas they have experienced cheating to win in, win in most cases, I, I expect. Although they don't seem to respond all that strongly to cheating to lose, um, I think it is by far the bigger issue for esports. I think match, match fixing is way above the cheating to win varieties in terms of how important it is, and I suspect in terms of how common it is as well. I totally agree, and I um, I forgot my point here. <laughs> Sorry. Well, while you remember, uh, one of our other guests has raised a hand. Ah, yeah. Hey, hey. Graham. Hi. I, unfortunately, I did miss some of the presentation. I was uh, on in transit. My my wireless headphones ran out of battery, so I would love to watch it again later and catch up. But I did have That's um, very kind of you. <laughs> I did have a question, um, a, a kind of a two part question about the continuity of punishments mm -hmm. for cheating. This is a subject I'm really interested mm -hmm. in. So, for example, you know, at Riot, what we do is when players enter the professional scene or at the beginning of every season, we will do behavior checks and, and kind of analyze their account history, or mainly for mm -hmm. instances of bad behavior rather than cheating. But certainly if there was a, you know, an incident of a player being banned from the game at one point, this might have an effect on their, their, their pro career. So I'm interested to know your thoughts on whether if, if a player um, uh, you know, cheats within just ladder play and then goes on into a professional league, whether there should be yeah, some con yeah. con continuity between these. And then, the other side of this is, um, you know, as you know, South Korea has such an advanced esports culture that it's mm -hmm. to the point where if you're caught, um, you know, and doing any form of cheating in South Korea can be you can be given a fine. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, there was this famous incident not too long ago of a South Korean politician whose election run was kind of ground to a halt because it was found out that she win traded in League of Legends uh, <laughs> a long time ago. And I mean, that's I unheard. did not see that. Oh, wow. It's, uh, I'll, I, I can pop a link in the, the chat. Oh, I mean, it's you, you. obviously unheard of in, in Europe, but, but I'm curious to know whether so you think far, that's yeah. Yeah, yeah, so far. <laughs> I'm curious to know your reaction to that in the sense of like, does that seem, you know, in a way justified or just should the, the nature, is that kind of too far in terms of the uh, perception of cheating and, and its effect and it's kind of a perception on one's moral character in that sense? Yeah, fascinating questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I guess the first thing is that sort of, is there anyone on earth who didn't cheat at a game at least at some point in their life when they were a child or teenager? I guess would be the first question. And I don't know whether there are. I'm sure I, I am sure some folks exist, but I'm sure that many, 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 many people as kids and teens, when they were like playing cards with their grandparents or something, they tried to sneak a card, this type of thing. Like this is the kind of thing kids and teens do. And so kind of taking it to the to that extreme, I guess my point is that. I think it's very hard to find anyone whose conduct is going to be perfect. So that's point one. Um, but then in the specifics of, yeah, should ladder matches, matches which in some sense don't, don't in air quotes, mean a great deal, should they count, should bad behavior there count in the future? Because I think, well, I feel like both arguments are quite convincing here, right? There's one to say, when there's no money at stake, there's no careers, no sponsorships, whatever, does it really matter what someone does? And although I wouldn't hold to that argument my, myself, I'd say it does. I think it's still a reasonably convincing point of view that if there's nothing at stake, nothing financial, material, lives, jobs, and so on, at stake, then doesn't matter that much. And like we talked um, about earlier, like the perception of how severe something, of how severe cheating is, is, is important here in that a player who decides to cheat when there's, in air quotes, nothing at stake, is very different from a player who decides to cheat when there's lives and money and so on at stake. 
So that's, I think, a complicating issue. On the other hand, I think there's a strong argument to say, um, what's that quote? I'm not sure who it's from. Um, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. You might have seen this quote. It's, 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 um, it's one of those kinds of inspirational quotes which drift around on Facebook and so on. But I think it makes sense here that if someone is happy to cheat when, when there's nothing at stake, when there's money that they could gain by cheating, does that not imply that in fact they'd be more inclined then to cheat when there's something to be gained? So like, I think both sides can be argued that when there's very little to be gained, we shouldn't judge people too harshly for what they do because there's very little at stake. On the other hand, can also say, well, if they cheat when there's nothing at stake, what will they do when there's something big at stake, which, which they could win or have a stronger shot at winning uh, by cheating? So I think it's really difficult is the answer. And I hope that, that uh, this is not a kind of dreadfully um, unsatisfying answer, but it's very difficult. Um, it's very complex. I mean, I think it comes down to, like uh, Oli mentioned, kind of what are the specific motivations taking place here? What is this person doing? What 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 are they after like from the outside we could see two we could see two players who cheat in league ladder let's say and we say you cheated that's bad a month ban but if we if we could see inside their minds inside their homes and their lives and so on maybe one of them cheated because they are eager to try to make money from league and they want to experiment and see whether cheating can work or not and they put lots of time and thought into this and they have a specific goal and they're testing it while the other player just for a laugh wanted to, to just win a match with invincibility right and from our point of view on the outside those two look identical and i think that's a big issue here in in trying to think about what sorts of responses should there be for cheating in ladder and these sorts of things when it's so hard to divine what are the exact motives and the and the exact intentions. As for your second case and that fascinating example, um, again, that uh, I mean, firstly, what a truly fascinating modern world we all live in, I must say. But um, I think that. Again, that kind of goes back to what is the connection between our behavior in games and our behavior in real life? Because a lot of people, of course, in competitive games, in esports and so on, see these things as being deeply serious, right? Even if you are simply someone who plays, who plays on ladder and this is not your job and, and you don't aspire for it to be your job, people still take this extremely seriously. It's something people commit to and focus on and spend lots of time and labor and effort on. And it's not surprising that, that people who would cheat to skip past that kind of progress would be seen very negatively. And it's not unreasonable to suggest that that does tell you something about their character. And yet on the other hand, like I just said, someone can cheat just because they they just fancy a laugh and the game means nothing to them and they and maybe they don't even know how much the game does mean to other people right and so to them it's just yeah i'll just have a laugh and cheat and so it's so hard to i think group people and make the and and make these kinds of judgments on character without knowing what does cheating mean to that specific person. Um, and as for kind of gaming, cheating and boosting and so on, impacting on politics, I mean, that is fascinatingly bizarre, no doubt. Um, but should it have an effect? I guess it, it depends on what the person's motive was. Were they just playing around or were they taking it seriously and really trying to subvert the game, the system, the ladder, the ecosystem, the community, or whatever. And it's very difficult to say. Um, yeah, those were fantastic questions. Thank you. And I hope that I gave at least a vague answer to them, but they are very tough questions. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Like they're not going to be, there's not going to be an easy answer. I guess the one thing I would add is, you know, it also depends on the length of time that one is, is, you know, if it's a, if it was like a one-time use of a cheat, 
or if it's yeah, a system or if it was a systemic use you know if you look at the the the, the um coaching bug scandal in in csgo right there was a lot of mm, professional mm, yes, yes, yes. coaches who knew what they were doing for a long time and just it was like an almost becoming an open secret um you know that kind of That's thing a should perfect warrant. example yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. Much- yes yes um absolutely i mean i think um yeah like if it goes beyond a certain point or or rather the longer it goes the harder it becomes to ascribe harmless motives i guess that's how i put it if you yeah if you just cheated once and it and it was just fun and you don't care for that game and you move on that's very, that's so different from you discover a bug and you actively don't tell people about it and you pursue it and you exploit it and so on yeah um, Connie's just asked uh, in chat: Should should uh, players be be banned across games? Again, uh, a fascinating one, and I think again that goes back to these questions of what are the motives, what are the impacts, what can we learn about someone's character or about the labour ecosystem that they exist in, and so on, based on what they do. Um, my inclination would be that it has to be answered on a case-by-case basis. If someone has consistently cheated for a year in CSGO by taking Adderall every single event or something like that, and then they get found out and then they shift game, I don't think we, and by we I mean esports viewers, esports scholars, esports people who work in esports, people who work at Riot, etc. I don't think we collectively I don't think we need to give them the benefit of the doubt at that point, to be honest, I don't. Um, I, I, I think there's so much has taken place that there's no, even being generous, there's no reason to give that player the benefit of the doubt, I think, which does not mean condemning them as an awful, evil, um, soulless person because like we've said maybe this is their only source of income and maybe they have people who they need to support and maybe they will do whatever they can to support those people right and so on so it's not a moral judgment but um so i think we should remain open to moral incentives given the people given how young people are in esports given the kinds of job prospects for young people given what esports careers are like in terms of labor in terms of precariousness i think we should always be open-minded in terms of moles but we should not i think if someone has a consistent and long history of cheating i i i wouldn't see any pragmatic let's say rather than mole i wouldn't see any pragmatic reason to extend them the benefit of the doubt about potential cheating in the future that just seems counterproductive even if we say okay you cheated maybe from your point of view you genuinely had a good reason to right maybe you had to secure money and income and all these things and maybe from your point of view cheating in a computer game is nothing compared to being able to feed your family and that's fair enough on one level but even if we suspend those moral judgments, I don't think we can suspend those uh, pragmatic judgments. Thank you for, for explaining, Mark. I have a, uh, something to add to the argument you made um, earlier about what is at stake. And the question I ask about um, professional players and cheating prevalence. And I just wanted to add that I think that what is at stake is a really important factor. And I would assume that people that are in the process and the development of reaching the level of mastery use some kinds of cheating more frequently than professional players. For example, using aimbots, because Mm -hmm. professional players might have a greater risk of being caught. And they also have different resources and um, maybe different goals or different environment that influences the way they they would act on uh, cheating. Um, this was just uh, a thing mm. I wanted to add. Thank you, Brian, for joining. Do, do you want to say something to that or can I just ask another a quick question? one on that? Yeah, um, I think that's a good point because like in so many careers, what you have to do to get the job is more than what you have to do to keep the job. 
right? That's like a very well-known kind of labor, di labor dynamic, I guess, right? So if you are an aspiring esports player and you know I I I I must play or seem to play at the ten at the ten out of ten level, let's say, in order to get this full time esports job in a team. But to maintain that job, I must only play at nine point five out of ten. Then I agree. I think there's definitely a motive there to 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 fake it until you make it. I guess to use a very trite phrase, to yeah, kind of. Um, to do things you wouldn't do later on, knowing you don't intend to do them later in order to secure the job, essentially. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, sorry, you had another, a, a further question, Ollie? Yeah. Um, um, do, what do you think are the greatest differences or similarities between um, cheating in esports and cheating in other competitive situations or sports, for example? Mm -hmm. Biggest differences. Um, that's an interesting question. Let me think about that for a second. Isn't isn't it drugs? By the way, just uh, you know, the traditional <laughs> sports. You know, I know. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, Ethic. They said uh, they did an investigation on Adderall and Ritalin, and they said they didn't find any evidence uh, that mm, professional yeah. players were using uh, ADHD drugs. But as we know, uh, with the Olympics, and you know. A lot yes, of very yes. sports always ways to uh to sneak around the system absolutely yeah yeah um i guess i think the biggest difference to some to some extent might be in terms of this cheating to lose a match fixing issue because i think the average football fan knows a lot more about how match fixing works than the average esports fan without a doubt i mean like i talked uh, through in the paper from our data, it seems like the average esports fan knows very little about match fixing and cheating to lose and how these things work. I cannot imagine any football fan, cricket fan, tennis fan, whatever, who is who is not at least fairly aware of how cheating to lose and match fixing work. Um, I think that would be hard to imagine um, on some level. So I think that I think that there's a big knowledge gap there and that and that i think is quite a big difference and then also i think just these attitudes that cheating can be forgivable in some contexts is very distinctive to esports i think um i don't think you'd find that in traditional physical sports at all like if someone throws a tennis match and there seems to be a in air quotes good reason i don't think people would say oh it's fine that they corrupted wimbledon it's fine I do not think that would happen at all. Um, yeah, so I think I think those things stand out. The comparative lack of knowledge when it comes to match fixing and the comparative generosity towards certain kinds of cheating. I think those two things stand out as being somewhat distinctive for 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 esports, I think. Yeah. Maybe uh, just to add on to that, if you think about it, it's a, it's a crime to switch your football allegiance in England to a different team. <laughs> but, when, but, you know, in esports tournaments, when you're there live, you know, even if the Finnish guys are there and ends go out, they'll just start supporting a different team. And, and those, mm, you know, mm. century old traditions aren't there in esports. So maybe it's just a, you know, in an era of data and hacking and stuff, a different perception of without traditions. That makes you know different rules apply. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point too. I think, yeah, yeah, that kind of east e that esports is new, esports teams are new, esports players change teams so much. These sorts of things, yeah, yeah, probably do do reduce the the kind of historical or like emotional weight that cheating might carry. Yeah, yeah. Ben, hello. Thank you so much for coming along, Ben. What are your thoughts? <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Mark. I, I love this work and looking forward to reading the, the full paper. This is going to be a disaster of a question. So just to I'm prepare. ready. <clears throat> Emotionally, so, physically, I'm ready. <laughs> um, I thought immediately of my kids, right, who after every loss in Fortnite, they'll, they'll 
claim that the other player was hacking, right? <laughs> blame aimbot, right? Or they'll blame the oh, yeah, of course. gamers, right? Yes, of course. It was never that. How, how else could I have lost? Yes. Right, exactly. right. And, and so that got me thinking about kind of, you know, your expertise in live streaming and Twitch, right? And esports. And perhaps maybe you could talk about this performance of cheating. And, and what that might look like. Is there a performative element here? Because I'm, uh, I'm thinking about hoaxing, right? And how hoaxing can mm-hmm. be generative, which is supposed to uncover like power relations and the underlining, you know, uh, uh, values of the, of the community. So uh, yeah, I'm, I, that's a, a awful question. But if you could speak about that, maybe that idea of like performing cheating and what does that tell us? Mm, mm, mm. Well, I think you made a great point about, and it kind of goes goes back to a few questions back when it comes to 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 the gap between cheating and the perception of cheating, or things which which people perceive to be cheating. Um, I think it's very, I think it's very tricky to say, like. I think a great study, let's, let's put it this way. I think a great future study would be to examine online competitive game players and get a genuine sense of how often they think someone's cheating against them. I think that would be a fantastic follow-up study um, because I think that, that that would, I think, unpack a lot of these dynamics of what sorts of things pe- pe- people see as being cheating and what sorts of issues arise um what was the second half of your question again oh it's just uh, rambling about uh you know <laughs> thinking about the performativity of cheating right like that there's this performance of cheating and then maybe tying that to uh well i i just think about hoaxing right which uh can be so generative and can be uh what exposes kind of underlining power relations right when uh these these hoaxing groups or whatever make fun of like what is in power and what does that say about esports when sorry right right Mm -hmm. yeah yeah does cheating like speak to these larger power dynamics in esports so that that's a large like expansive question right yeah yeah sorry sorry ben i i have got you yeah um i think it does insofar as if there was no need to cheat then no one would do it and that's a very obvious comment but i think it's one worth making if if we were not entangling people's careers, people's incomes, people's mental health, people's future jobs, and all these things, if, the, if these things were not entangled with playing a computer game really, really well, then there would be no need to cheat. And while, of course, cheating would still take place because, of course, people cheat when there's nothing at stake and so on in um, ladder games and these sorts of things, or comparatively little at stake and so on. Um, I think it does show us that that there are major power dynamics which do make it difficult, I think, for many esports players to to completely stick within the rules. Like I think like I think a nice comparison, right, is all these top streamers and some top esports players who who are clearly always seeking to remain in the limelight whether it's by winning a big match, which is one thing, or by saying something contentious or saying something idiotic or saying something offensive or saying something controversial and these sorts of things. Um, I think that's a nice kind of comparison um, in that there are particular pressures that generate these sorts of particular behaviors. And Clearly, one must one must acknowledge one's bias. I, like you, of course, come from a more sociology background, so so I'm always kind of going to seek out these kinds of structural explanations for people's behaviors and so on. But um, yeah, I mean, as my own research and that of others has shown, the esports kind of labor field is so demanding, is so competitive, and is so. And yet, on some on some level, is also so fragile. And I guess what I mean by the, by that is the speed at which esports players can sometimes rise and fall, and how quickly a a mistake can cause you to plummet out 
and how quickly some big win can can cause you to to plummet up. I think all these sorts of contexts and scenarios can defer, can make cheating more likely, more normalized even. And like, um, I think about sort of some, some of those, um, like um, a Graham mentioned, when the coaching bug and so on in CSGO came up, how everyone knew it existed and no one reported it for months and months and months and months, and months so that they could keep exploiting this. Like, um, I think that's a nice example because it shows that there is a kind of collective, a kind of collective, what's the word I'm looking for? Almost a kind of collective sort of hive mind type thing, let's say, where it's not necessarily in a game theory sense in anyone's interest with an eSport itself to push super hard on cheating. As in, if you are a, a, a player, is it in your interest to really support deep interrogation of cheating? Well, if you think that, that there's a risk of you being cheated against, then yeah, I guess. But if you're a non-cheating player and you believe your foes, your foes are non-cheating, there's no real value to making everything harder and take longer and more expensive and have all these anti-cheating regimes and so on and clearly if you are a cheater then you have no interest in having cheating um, pinned down and so on so i think esports collectively in terms of the individual players in terms of the ecosystem in every way i think there's relatively little inclination for those working professionally within this ecosystem to really push on dealing with cheating i think there's relatively little collective motivation and while the viewers like i talked about in the talk see this as a legitimacy issue right as esports should be cheating free in order to prove that it's very uh up market above board whatever i think those arguments carry some weight but esports survived fine before these 20 new bodies which all claim to be the e the esports cheating regulator came into existence Esports was surviving before that, and person, and I don't see much of a difference. And sorry if that was a super rambly response, but um, I think yeah, these are interesting questions. No, thank thank you, Mark, for uh, giving a great answer to a poor question. <laughs> are there further questions on spectators' perceptions or judgments on cheating in esports? Otherwise, I'd like to add another question. Please do, Ollie. Okay. Um, I asked before, uh, before the, because this moves uh, the discussion in another direction. You recently published a study that I'm really interested in. It was in the Journal of Information, Communication and Society. And it's entitled Gamer Identities of Video Game Live yes, Streamers yes. with Disabilities. Can you say something about this study? Absolutely, yes. Um, so back in 2018, um, I published a paper about um, streamers on Twitch with either mental health issues or physical disability issues and how they navigate the platform and what they get out of it and, and how Twitch is both a, ve is, is both a very um, rewarding and very emancipatory platform for, for these demographics, but also comes with distinctive sets of issues also. And this second paper, which like I said, I think came out last year or something, or this year maybe, um, was a follow-up uh, on, on, on that piece where my co-author and I, we had a look at people with very uh, substantial or, or, or very noteworthy physical disabilities on Twitch. So for, so, um, so for instance, some of our case studies, were people who were playing games without hands, for instance, the, these sorts of things. And uh, what we, in essence, found was that uh, many of these players are extremely good at games uh, in spite of the physical challenges, and many, in fact, play uh, esports games as well, and that, there are, and that there are extremely strong dynamics of sort of emancipation and self-realization and these sorts of things taking place um, for these players, yeah. 
Oh, and uh, also that there's this kind of intriguing tension between being inspirational, where on the one hand, a lot of these streamers are quite keen to be, in air quotes, inspirational in that kind of mold of, if I can build all this and I was born without hands, then what excuse do you, you have? Is this kind of common framing which they use. Um, but on the other hand, of course, that inspirational framing kind of others people with strong physical disabilities and creates a kind of bigger divide, right? By, by marking them out as people who are expected to be, in air quotes, inspirational. So yeah, that's what that study was about. And how many streamers were included in the study? Uh, I believe we did a close reading of eight or nine, I think, um, of the most kind of well-known, uh, very marked physical disabilities on Twitch. Um, yeah, eight or nine or so, I think. Um, though I'd have to have to check the paper again now. Okay, and and was it just streaming in general, or did they play uh, specific video games? Or esports? Uh, game streaming in general, but there were a number who play things like, um, I think Street Fighter was quite a big one for one streamer, uh, CSGO was quite a big one for another streamer as well. Um, and like I say, these are very, very skilled players, um, strikingly skilled. And that was one of the kind of really um, intriguing things that came out was how kind of Twitch has enabled these these gamers slash streamers to 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 challenge so many expectations and so many assumptions around the relationship between physical ability and esports and like i know i've talked with some of you guys about before um it's interesting how um how short esports careers for instance are in terms of age and yet in, fight, in fighting games, for instance, we see loads of players beyond 30 who are still at the absolute, absolute peak. And yet that seems to be pretty unique to fighting games, which does suggest a cultural dimension of how long we believe esports players' careers can last, as well as a purely physical or cognitive uh, dimension as well. But, that, but that's a side issue, and that's something I'd like to do some research on in the future really interesting um i think you also mentioned the names of the streamers which is interesting to to take a look at how they stream and yes, how they yes. uh, how their appearance matches with the results of your study i i think i will give it a, a look and i recommend it and hopefully you will not find the study to be uh dreadfully lacking <laughs> i don't think so um and beside the step you just mentioned to wanting to investigate um, the how the age impacts um, performance or the, the career in esports. What are further steps in this direction of gamer identities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's definitely a study to be done on basically why do esports players retire? Because um, I, think, I think we all think we have a pretty decent perception of what the answer to that question is. But increasingly having been talking with esports players and Twitch streamers now for six years, I don't think our general perception that they retire just because they're no longer at the peak of their game or that type of thing, or, or they retire because their hands are worn out and these sorts of things. I don't think these two discourses are actually necessarily all that accurate. Um, I think that there's a decent amount which suggests that there are broader cultural and professional dynamics between players, teams, sponsors, players as celebrities, as well as players as 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 players. Um, I think that there are that there are other dy dynamics at play which kind of define the limits of what an esports career can be for many players. And like I say, I think uh, fighting games are. A fascinating example where so many top players are past the age of 30. Outside of fighting games, top players beyond the age of 30 is almost unknown. And yet fighting games are as physically demanding as they come, right? When it comes to speed and and reflex and input precision and all and all these things. And so the, the stark differences there, combined with of course how culturally different fighting games are from every other esports um context 
I think there's something there. I think there's something there which is worth investigating why do top fighting game players persist so much longer than other players in other esports what are the dynamics at play here is there something we can learn from this in terms of making in terms of supporting potentially longer careers in non-fighting game disciplines let's call them um yeah i think those are interesting questions and like i said i think they are questions which which definitely go beyond I was getting ISI in my hands or I was no longer that good. Because to some extent, skill in esports as skill in any sport or anything on earth is to some extent social is to some extent socially constructed by how by how people talk about that person and think about that person and what they do and how that person presents themselves and contextualizes themselves. So uh, yeah, I think that there's something there. Um, so yeah, look for that study in 2028, I think. Well, it, I think that's a really uh, sort of interesting point because uh, I was listening to a podcast on football the other day and they were talking about data and they actually said the data they use on player performance is working because they're not uh, retiring earlier despite the extra demands, the extra games, mm-hmm. the extra pressures. Mm-hmm. And so it's by the fact that they're not starting to retire earlier and even a little bit longer shows that it's mm-hmm. management mm-hmm. of stuff. And I, yeah, and I just, yeah. when you say fighting games, I sort of thought of StarCraft as a single player game. And then, but StarCraft is, it's our, you know, it's, it's intense. It's those many movements mm-hmm. per second more than a lot of other games, which may be the physical. I think you're right. There's a lot to be said about the variables. But when you say fighting games to precision, I always think that there's a lot more learned responses. Uh, you know, the traditional Street Fighter, like when I was 10 in the arcade, the, you know, the dragon punch, the mm. fireball, these, these, these patterns that maybe are easier to extend. Whereas if you're playing CSGO or Valorant or something, there's just so many more situations that you have to swing out there and there and look there and maps change. And I wonder if, you know, there's a certain level of, once you're a Street Fighter player, no matter what they do to the game, you know your stuff. Well, I think that's a great thought, although it's, all, though it's a good thing there's no fighting game player in this chat. Otherwise, I think they'd say, Brian, how dare you suggest our field of games is less demanding than StarCraft? Um, yeah, I think it's... I think it's Clicks I per minute, it's, it's in rounds. Of course, there's a little break. StarCraft <laughs> match, you're, you're constantly going for that full 45 minutes. I mean, you, you, it, a fighting game is in, in intense bursts. It's a, it's a different exercise. But, I think this goes back to something which um, I think, in fact, we talked about um, in person a few years back that, like, we as game slash esports researchers, there's no real theorization of what skill is in games uh, still. In my view, no one has, like, written the foundational book on what is skill in games. No one has done this kind of base research because much like cheating, we all know what skill is in games. We all know what a better player looks like, a weaker player looks like. We we all have these sorts of assumed tacit ideas, I think, of, of what these things entail. But I'm not sure how accurate those things are. Like, yes, of course, reflex is a great deal of skill, but also timing is a great deal of skill and making choices and all these sorts of things. And Although, although, of course, the APM in a fighting game will be lower than StarCraft 2, of course, does that necessarily mean the skill level is lower? I think a nice contrast would be, for instance, um, poker. If you did a live poker event in terms of APM, two, <laughs> three, maybe, maybe four, if things are like really cracking along, maybe four or five actions per minute in a live poker game per player, maybe. And yet, I mean, poker is a game of intense skill and there's 10,000 people or something on earth who make a full-time living from poker. So- I never said it less to... skill. I just said it's no, 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 differently course, executed, course. right? Just to exactly, that exactly. Clear. And so, so, yeah, so, so, so does the nature of the game also affect how long someone can usefully survive within that world to keep playing at that top level? And as you say, like um, something like Melee is quite a nice case here, right? Because it has never been patched. It's never been updated. 
by definition, you will never have to learn that much new knowledge. Like every few years, someone finds some new piece of tech in Melee where these exact keys and these exact frame inputs will make you move a fraction faster. And then everyone learns how you do that. And then the kind of, and then the kind of steady playing field resumes again, right? So there's, there's definitely also questions around how often is the game updated? How often does it change? How transferable are these skills? Um, to, what, to what extent, and to what extent are the top players playing close to perfectly? Or are they much further away? As in, no StarCraft II player plays StarCraft even remotely close to perfectly, right? Of course not. But are there Street Fighter players who play Street Fighter close to a game theory optimal style? Probably, yeah, I expect there are. Um, yeah, so I think also as well as kind of different cultural dynamics, employment dynamics, I think also different kinds of games probably do lend themselves to careers with different structures or different trajectories or different shapes to them um, as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate the questions and the thoughts. We have now time for one last question. Is there anyone that has one? Well, I must say then, thank you all so much for uh, coming along and thank you, Ollie et al, for the hosting. It's been a small but elite group, I think, in this chat. And thank you all for uh, turning up and listening to me talk about esports cheating. And like I say, um, if you like the paper preprint, send me an email or a DM on Twitter and I'll send you along the full paper on what esports viewers think about cheating. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And thank I really... you for the social media plugs there, Ollie. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it and I hope and I think everyone else did too. And I also thank every participant that joined the colloquium today. The next one will be hosted at the 17th of November. We have no speaker yet, but I am thinking about presenting my research from my PhD project. So feel free to also join this presentation. And yeah, that's it for today. Brian, uh, yeah, Brian, Ben, Connie, Eric, thank you for joining. And Mark, thank you for um, your insights. I will really, I would really enjoy further studies in this direction and also some qualitative studies on players' perspectives on cheating as well. Mm -hmm. Have a nice day and see you next time. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Bye for now. Goodbye.